taking my road on the beautiful road of scenic Utah, going to the Hill Aerospace Museum. We will be going through the history and background of a lot of these beautiful restored aircraft. We will take a deep dive into when jets entered military service and the first jet on jet engagement in history. And how and when did helicopters enter military service? And a lot more. World's biggest egg Benedict. I'm so excited. I don't know what's down here, but I want to know. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. You ask yourself, where are we today and what are we looking at? That is really historic and really cool. I'm in an active Air Force base. I'm in Utah, which is a great state. And I'm at a Hill Air Force Base Museum. Look at all these great, amazing planes around us from all of history of the US Air Force. This is gonna be a really, really cool journey for you to see some of the great things we put up in the sky that you could see here at the museum also, as a civilian, you can come here and visit this phenomenal museum where they restore all these great old planes to keep history alive. Come on, let's see. For you, a thirsty pilot up in the air and your tank's running low, this is what you want to see. Now, the reason our Air Force can do all these phenomenal, cool things far, far away is because of planes like this, Strato Tanker. This plane will refuel all the jets and all the different planes we have in the sky to extend their mission. The first successful aerial refueling took place on June 25th, 1923. After World War II ended, the need for a long-range jet bomber was seen as imminent, and the first bomber off the assembly line was the B-47 Stratojet, a beautiful aircraft, but it had its flaws and the next evolution on the scale was the B-52, the mother of all jet bombers, still in active service today. The B-52 will fly over 8,800 miles and with refueling can stay aloft for days. If you're a soldier on the ground and you're taking fire from those hills and you just can't get to it with your small arms, this is what I want to see, B-52. I'm sorry, I love this plane. I'm guy's guy. I like to blow things up. This thing can drop some bombs and heavy things on bad people around the world. This will reach out and touch somebody. I love this plane. The B-52 will carry 70,000 pounds of weaponry and will carry most nuclear weapons, which is what built and designed for. Facing the new Soviet threat, it was made in flight in April 1952. There has been numerous upgrades to the airframe and the plane is expected to serve all the way into the 2050s and probably longer. It is the workhorse of the Air Force. Nathan Twining, Air Force Chief of Staff, once said, the long rifle was a great weapon of its day. Today, the B-52 is the long rifle of the air age. The C-123 provider cargo plane Phenomenal plane. This plane was an incredible versatile airplane. It was very, very tough, very durable. It would land on all sorts of different dirt strips, especially in Asia, uh, Vietnam during the war, supplying the troops in far out places. This particular plane here at the museum was also in a James Bond movie. So if I planes go here, I guess it's a site of a celebrity. The F-119 flying boxcar was designed in 1947 where it made its maiden flight. It was originally a cargo plane for medium-sized hauling of cargo, wounded, and equipment, paratroopers, so on. Service with Strategic Air Command from 1955 to 73, but saw service around the world way into the 90s. Armed with four miniguns and stingers, they were used very successful in close air support missions. The reason why this plane was referred to as the flying box car was because the cargo would hold just about 93% of the volume of a railroad box car. And I suppose you could say it looks a little bit like an aerodynamic box car with a twin tail. Even if you don't know anything about World War II or aircraft in general, this plane 
you should recognize the B-29 Superfortress. At the end of World War I, it was suspected by many military commanders that the next war would be fought and won from the air. Thus the concept for a long-range heavy bomber had been seeded. In 1940, the design of the B-29 Superfortress had begun. It were to become one of the most famous and significant aircraft in history. At the end of the war, it was proved to be one of the most technologically advanced aircraft from that time, both with pressurized cabins and remote-controlled fire systems. The plane even saw service from 1950 to 1953 over the skies of Korea, facing both jets and missiles. The last B-29 Superfortress Squadron was retired in 1960. During World War II, most of the main powers have experimented and worked on an atomic bomb, developed with much secrecy and four billions of dollars spent. Finally, on July 16, 1945, the gadget detonated the first nuclear bomb at the Trinity test site. Despite all the secrecy, when President Truman informed Soviet Premier Stalin, he was not surprised. On August 6, 1945, the B-29 Superfortress in Olegay took off from the small Tinian island headed for the Japanese mainland. At approximately 8.15, it dropped its deadly cargo, instantly killing 80,000 people. And in spite of this, the Japanese government still failed to surrender. So on August 9, 1945, a B-29 named Boxcar loaded with a nuclear bomb designated Fat Man, proceeding to drop its payload on Nagasaki, finally ending World War II. This plane dropped the nuclear bombs on Japan, effectively ending World War II. You could say this is the ultimate game changer from that point on. This plane was so high tech and so special at the time that when Stalin got his hands on three of them, he had his engineers take them apart, bolt by bolt, wire by wire, and exactly replicate them for the Russian Air Force. Of course, by the time they're done with that, we already come up with something new. But this was a very, very special plane with a very special history that will live forever. This one, you know, C-130 Hercules, still flies today, delivers supplies, weaponry, foods, aid to refugees all over the world. It's been doing so for many, many years and will probably still be in service for many, many years to come. Some interesting will feature on this one, however, are these guys. The little boosters they have mounted on the sides of this airframe is to help the plane get off the ground on a shorter runway when packed. The first tests of rocket-assisted takeoff was used in the 1920s to boost gliders into the air. During World War II, all warring nations were using these to shorten their runways for their heavy-loaded aircrafts and fighters. The Luftwaffe used both liquid-fueled and solid-fueled boosters. Many of these were jettisoned after takeoff and can still be found in lakes and forests around Europe. The F-4 Phantom saw a lot of time in Vietnam. Dropped a lot of bombs in over there. It's a great versatile platform. Eventually, when they put guns on it, did a little better. I remember talking to one of the pilots once and he was telling me it had the aerodynamics of a school bus with extremely powerful engines. Before every pilot's allowed to fly, the big fun stuff, they have to learn how to fly. The Trojan was one of the old trainers. You see it sitting here in front of all these phenomenal jets. That was still where it started for a lot of those guys that ended up flying something bigger and a lot faster. The B-1A-1 was initially developed in the 1970s as a replacement for the B-52. Now you can call me romantic. I'm sure you can call me many things. But the B-1 Lancer is the sexiest aircraft here. It is gorgeous. I, it, it has this sleek Coca-Cola bottle shape, Kirby. You all know where I'm going with this. This is a sexy body aircraft. No idea what it is to fly. Still in service today, long range bomber. But the shape of this plane is just magnificent. 
The bike builder in me wants to build a custom Harley dedicated to honoring the shape of this plane because this is just gorgeous. It was developed as a high-speed, long-range Mark 2.2 strategic bomber. It was tested in the mid-70s and the early 80s, during which it was modernized into the B-1B and finally delivered in 1985. It will carry 74,000 pounds of ordnance, both guided and unguided, and an improved radar reduction of the radar cross-section by an order of magnitude. It is crammed by electronics and countermeasures and holds almost 50 world records for speed, payload, range, time of climb in its class. Nearly 40% of the total tonnage delivered by coalition air forces during Operation Enduring Freedom was dropped by the B-1. That included nearly 3,900 JDAMs gorgeous and it is very very functional for the heavy lift troop transporter there's nothing like the Globemaster the slightly pregnant looking plane behind me double-decker cabin will carry 200 troops across the world to battle we get the hard fast and in numbers This is really an amazing museum. Like I always say about all museums, they bring history to life for the next generation. And I can only once again tell you, take your kids here, take your kids to every museum. They really need to see and learn history. Something I can recognize. The cannon, World War I. Here you get to see and feel, get a sense of these planes, these achievements that did so much for so many. It's worth a visit. I always did have a sore spot for the Skytrain because after the war, some time after the war, my mom was a stewardess, and she flew as it became the DC-3 on the civilian version of that plane, and she always has great memories of it. Not to mention all the paratroopers it kicked out over Normandy. Same plane. It was when I saw this sign, I thought it was time for a little bit of history. We have always been told that the main air battle, the first jet-on-jet -jet engagement, was the F-86 versus the MiG-15. And here at the museum, they have two beautifully restored models of both planes, and they look so phenomenally similar. You may all have noticed that, I'm sure. In the skies of Korea from June 25th, 1950 till July 27th, 1953, the jets ruled the skies. The MiG and the F-86 duked it out like the best style of air war from World War II. World War I, we had Aces, MiG Alley, we had cover pictures of Time magazines of pilots. Now the first air-to-air -air combat between fighter jets took place November 8th, 1950 where an F-80C from the 16th Fighter Squadron countered a MiG-15. After the dogfight, F-80C pilot Russell Brown claimed the first aerial victory in a jet vs. jet engagement claimed to have shot down a MiG-15. However, it was later discovered the MiG made it home and landed safely. However, it would not be long. The very next day, a Grumman F9F2B Panther took off. It was piloted by Lieutenant Commander William T. Amon, commanding officer of the VF-111 Sundowners. At the same time, a MiG-15 from the 139th Guards Fighter Air Regiment took off, piloted by Captain Mikhail Grachev. 
at the end of a long dogfight, both Armin and his wingman had scored hits on the MiG, which crashed into a hillside, noting the first aerial jet-on-jet -jet kill in the world. Noting that this kill was done by an F-9F Panther and not by an F-86. However, it would not be long before both the P-80s and the Panthers retired from combat service over the skies, being replaced in the air superiority role by the F-86 and the F-94. And the rest, as they say, is history. And speaking of the history, The F-86 carried six M350 caliber machine guns, while the MiG carried two 23mm and one 37mm cannon that was designed to destroy enemy bombers. The MiG was an incredibly resilient and tough aircraft. The MiG's cannons fired slower but larger and far more destructive shells. It made it harder for them to hit the Sabre. However, the Sabre's guns fired at a higher rate, but much smaller caliber bullets, making it hard for them initially to shoot down the MiGs. Initially in the war, the MiG was flown by Russian pilots, who were not allowed to communicate in Russian because no one was allowed to know that they were there. Later on, the MiGs were flown by Chinese and North Korean pilots without the same level of training that the Russian World War II pilots had. Inevitably, both planes wrote their pages in history, being the first conflict fought by jets versus jets in the skies. Now, we have all noticed the incredible similarity between the F-86 and the MiG-15. I wonder if that is a coincidence? Or could it be the traditional spying, tradecraft, could it be that the Russians had copied the F-86 just like they did with the Tu-4? Or could maybe we have stolen a Russian design? Or possibly it all came from an era before. Now if you look at the beautiful MiG and the beautiful Saber closely, and you now look at this picture, they're very similar aren't they? Only difference is this was designed in Germany and flew in 1939. This is the German HE-178, the original test bed from the Luftwaffe on jet aircraft. Now take a look at this German puppy, the ME-1101. If ever there was a grandfather to the MiG and the Sabre, this would be it. The German Air Force almost managed to get into the sky by the time the war ended. However, both Russian, American and British scientists raided all they could out of Nazi Germany and brought the technology back and tested it. Which, one thing I have to say about the ME-1101 is that it does look an awful lot like the Bell X-5, doesn't it? It also looked an awful lot like the Yak-15 and it looks very much like the MiG-9 that was even equipped with German engines. Even the Swedish Air Force had one. It's safe to say that during World War II, all powers experiment with jet aircraft. I would love to do an entire episode about the de Havilland engine and how that was shut down because that could have been a serious contender to the ME-262 in 1944. Incidentally, the British had a jet as well, the Meteor, that flew about the same time. And it is only due to fate that those two aircraft did not clash out in the skies of Europe in 1943. Leaving us all to wonder which one of those two planes would have gotten the better of the other. During World War II, the Germans were the first to have an operational jet fighter. In 1942, the Russian BI-1 rocket interceptor was tested, however, never made it into service due to manufacturing problems. 
and the US had the Bell P-59 Air Comet that flew in 1942. It's very interesting and have to be mentioned that back in the day, the various countries Bureau of Ordnance, whether it be the Germans or the British or the Americans, were not really at the forefront of technology or very keen on changing things, especially when they had these wonderful piston aircraft in the 1940s. The German Heindel company, as well as Messerschmitt, had experimented and made these wonderful planes fly in the early 1941-42 period. The British de Havilland had made an amazing jet engine that was shut down and shelved. While the traditionalists in both air forces went with something they knew and understood. Had both air forces had the foresight to see where things were going, we could have had dogfights in the skies over Europe in 1943 already. But it boggles to mind. The Gloucester Meteor was the first British jet fighter and the Allies' only jet aircraft to achieve combat operations during the Second World War. It was a groundbreaking aircraft pioneered by Frank Whittle and his company. The Meteor continued in service several decades after the war and also saw service in Korea alongside the F-86 Sabre. Although at that time it was an obsolete design compared to the swept-wing fighters of the day. One of the most famous planes that came out of World War II must have been said to be the ME-262 that entered active service with the German Air Force in late 1944. This was the first active jet. And despite most of the records having been lost, misplaced, classified, it was reported that the ME-262 was the first jet to break the sound barrier in a dive. Now we talk about all these amazing planes that was developed out of Germany and continued the development in everywhere from Russia, America, even to Argentina where the Horton brothers went to continue working on their flying wing and incidentally a jet that looks very much like the Sabre and the MiG. Certainly it can be argued that the jet age started during the middle of World War II and took its origin from before the war. After the war as German technology was spread out amongst the victorious allies things really took off, especially with the Russian Yak-15 and MiG-9 testing. The MiG-9 saw service over the skies of Korea alongside of the MiG-15. But the seeds for these planes was laid during World War II. From a historical perspective, if you have an interest in Air Force, otherwise you probably wouldn't be watching this, I have to introduce you to the Arado. The Arado 234 was an amazing little plane that history seemed to have forgotten because it actually entered operational service in June 1943. It was a jet, it was handled well, it was faster than any Allied aircraft, it was designed as a bomber and as a reconnaissance aircraft. It was designed with an incredibly sturdy undercarriage since the Allied Air Forces had continuously bombed all German Air Force bases and runways, the Arado could take off from most rough surfaces and on sleds, skids in the snow. And the Arado also flew with assisted takeoff for shortening the runways and I promise you all, when I find one in the museum, I will crawl in and out of it and make a specific dedicated history piece on the Arado. The Arado 234 Blitz for Lightning was the world's first operational jet bomber reconnaissance aircraft. It actually flew a reconnaissance flight over the Allied beachheads in Normandy on August 2nd. With a maximum speed of 735 kilometers an hour, 459 miles, the Blitz easily eluded any Allied piston engine fighters. Both two and four engine configurations 
were developed and flown. The V7 model was powered by two Junkers Juno 004B1 engines. Later models were fitted with two BMW 003 engines but were very troublesome when they first appeared. It would fly reconnaissance missions at 30,000 and could carry 4,000 pounds of bombs. The Arada was also armed with two 20mm cannon and it was equipped with an autopilot. Although extremely successful, only 274 aircraft was ever built. The only known surviving Arado aircraft is currently on display at the Smithsonian. This little bird was the first that actively could evacuate wounded straight from the battlefield to the hospitals, to the MASH units. This raised the survivability rate of a combat wound dramatically. During the Korean War, little helicopters just like this one evacuated 18,000 of the war's totally 23,000 casualties back to MASH units. During World War II, the death rate of evacuated patients before they reached the medical facility was 4.5. Because of the heroic actions of these army pilots, it went down to 2.5 during the Korean War. This little bird and many, many birds like this saved a lot of lives. But how did it all start? Oh yes, we're back to World War II again, and of course, we're back to the Germans. Before the war, everybody tried to make the helicopter work and functional. However, as it so often is, history is misremembered, misquoted, and very often not correct when you search it online. With all respect to Mr. Sikorsky, he was not the first who flew a helicopter that was successful and productive. There's some evidence that the Beret Dora Juroplane flew in 1935 and supposedly climbed to an altitude of 158 meters and remained in air for more than an hour in 1936. June 1936 Dr. Heinrich Karl Johann Focke flew the FW-61 in his first free flight. This became the most significant kickoff for the entry of helicopters into military service. The F-61 is regarded as being one of the world's first helicopters that would practically be used. And to hammer home a nail in the coffin of Mr. Sikorsky's claim to being the first on February 19, 1938, in Berlin's huge Deutsche Halle, 25-year-old Hannah Reich, yes, her again, climbed into the helicopter and flew it around. In 1938, Lufthansa, the German airline, ordered a six-passenger version while military development continued. The Germans flew helicopters during World War II that was extremely capable and successful and in continuous service. For instance, the FA-23 Drache, or Dragon, came in different variations. The A model, an anti-submarine with depth charges. The B model, reconnaissance, long-range drop tanks. The C model, for search and rescue with a winch and cable. The D model, for cargo carrier, could lift up to 2,000 pounds. And an E model, as a trainer. Also, a few was mounted with machine guns. There is a vast number of different configurations and different helicopters in use with the German armed forces and especially the Navy. Search and rescue missions were often conducted by these small helicopters, both at sea and at altitude. These small, light, easy maneuverable machines lay the groundwork of what would become the famous airlift of wounded by the Bell helicopters in Korea. Now if we talk of sexy aircraft, let's take a look at the P-38 Lightning. This is a cool twin-engine plane, it's fast, one pilot, could fly far, and it went on a very special mission during World War II. After years of tension, finally on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese Navy attacked the base at Pearl Harbor, effectively bringing America into World War II. 
The attack was led and carried out by Admiral Yamamoto, commander of the Imperial Japanese Fleet. You may now ask yourself, what does this have to do with a beautiful, sleek, gorgeous two-engine long-range fighter aircraft? And for that very reason, in April 1943, when it was discovered that Admiral Yamamoto would be flying only 600 some miles from where the P-38 Lightnings were stationed, it was time to strike back. In light of 1943 technology, without radars in most planes, it was a long shot. One thing is knowing the Admiral's flight plan, or rough flight plan, to actually fly and intercept and find his lone plane 635 miles away was a bit of a gamble. At 700 hours, the planes left Henderson Field. At the same time, Admiral Yamamoto was almost late for his own flight at Rabaul. After hours of flying and searching, at 9.34, they spotted the Admiral's plane. There were two Betty bombers, he was in one of them. While the flight of Cirrus was flying cover, both had to be shot down to make sure. With barely four gallons of gas to spare, they made it back home safely. In 1937, a design specification was calling for a high altitude interceptor with heavy armament and a high rate of climb. Kelly Johnson designed the P-38 around a pair of liquid-cooled inline Allison engines, turboprop charge for high altitude performance. The first P-38 flew in January 1938 and proved to have exceptional performance. Initially, only 100 P-38s went into service in December 1941. The F model was equipped with self-sealing fuel tanks, armor, and entered service in 1942 had a top speed of 414 miles per hour and a ceiling of 44,000 feet. It was armed with a 20mm automatic cannon and four 12mm machine guns. They could be fitted with drop tanks for extra fuel or two 2,000 pound bombs. Some were also fitted with air intercept radar for the use of night fighters. Almost 10,000 Lightnings of all models were produced and the P-38 was dropped from service after the war. The Liberator is another great World War II aircraft, but it's still not quite as famous as that guy. The Flying Fortress was designed in 1934 to replace the aging B-10. The B-17 Model 299 first flew in July 28, 1935. It almost began to break records immediately. It was an all-aluminum fuselage, with four 750 horsepower Pratt & Whitney engines. On August 20th, it flew 2100 miles non-stop from Seattle to Wright Field in nine hours with an average speed of 232 miles an hour. Another record-breaking flight took place on 15 February 1938 when six fortresses took off from Miami, Florida on a goodwill mission to South America. They flew 5,225 miles to Buenos Aires in 28 hours with only one stop in the train in Peru. The ball turret, when you climb in the little ball, you swing around and you try to shoot at fighters shooting at you and you hope you're going to make it. Not the job I would really want in an aircraft, but even worse, the lowest survivability rate of this plane is this guy, the tail gunner, sitting way here in the back, and when fighters attack you from behind, what's the first thing they're going to shoot at? You sitting in there. These guys went up day after day after day to conduct the air war over Germany to end World War II, and a lot of them did not come back. Let's go look at the business end. Now as I'm standing here at the business end of B-17, looking at the bomb drop, we talk about how cool these aircraft was and how heroic the pilots were. We talk about some of the planes and what they can do and what they did. But let's not forget, anytime you send somebody off to war, somebody else dies and a lot of the guys don't come back. There's no glorification in the war, but we have to remember people are very, very different. 
and sometimes there are bad people doing bad things and the only way to stop them is the hard way. And that's why we build and perfect all these weapons of war so we can keep the peace. But for historical perspective, these planes made history. That's important. Is sometimes you just have to take a step back from why they were made and what they did and look at the beauty and the technological achievement behind them and just go with that because that's pretty cool. And despite years of political wrangling to get the planes online, it was not until January 12, 1939, President Roosevelt appropriated $300 million to purchase 3,000 airplanes for the Army Air Corps. Production was undertaken by Boeing, Vegas and Douglas. Now armed with 1150 cal machine guns and could reach a speed of 299 miles an hour. And a service ceiling of over 37,000 feet. On January 27, 1943, the first B-17s of the U.S. Army Air Force made their first attacks on Germany at the port of Wilhelmshaven. Alongside the B-24 Liberators, the B-17s were the mainstay of American bomber force until the Super Fortress finally came online and the game changed. The U.S. Army Air Corps purchased 12,725 B-17s of all different types. Few served for the Royal Air Force, Coastal Command, and the United States Navy for patrol, air sea rescue, and a submarine and other duties, including cargo conversions of the B-17 that was known as the XC-108. This one I flew in, it is a petrifying experience, but it's fun. You will notice a lot of spotter aircrafts in my movies, if you pay attention. You saw the shows where we talked about nuclear bombs, nuclear devices, and you saw the big plane outside that dropped the nuclear bombs, fat boy. This was the test bed of the nuclear bomb project. And there's going to be a whole lot of books and videos of mine coming out about how the Germans obtained the fuses to set that thing off and the other nuclear bombs as well. It may have something to do with surrender German technology. And speaking of surrender German technology, we've all heard about the Blitz, the Wunder weapons, the German rockets, the bombs, the V1s, V2s. This is a V1 with an American market on it. Brought a lot of them over and we tested the hell out of them to see how they worked and how we could build and improve on them. The first cruise missile in the world built in Germany, but here with American tail mark on them. The German World War II rocket program had by far been the most complicated and scientifically evolved of World War II. And after the war ended, the rockets, the parts, the scientists who built them were disseminated to all the warring powers, literally fighting over each scientist and bits and pieces of rockets they could find. A lot of the scientists went to America, where they eventually got us to the moon. Van Avon Braun comes into mind. We brought a lot of V1s and V2s over here to America, where we tested them in all different configurations. We tested a lot of V1s and V2s, including from ships and aircraft carriers, to get a better understanding on how these worked in order to kick our own rocket and missile program into full gear after the war, now competing with the Russians. At the end of the war, they even put a pilot in there. In fact, one of the first test pilots of the V-1 with the pilot was Hannah Reich, Hitler's favorite pilot. I believe she said something to the fact of never again because it was impossible to steer. Being one of the best test pilots World War II Germany had, Hannah Reich also test flew the Messerschmitt ME-163, the Comet. After one particular test flight where the wheels had gotten stuck, she crashed the Comet, broke her nose and jaw, and spent five months in the hospital, where after she could not wait to return back to test flying planes. Unfortunately, the Japanese made a point of putting pilots in their bombs and steer them into our aircraft carriers and our ships was very bad. And from that testing, the U.S. began designing our own missiles, such as the SM-62 Snark, the CIM-10 Bomac, and the Minutemen, 
all on display here at the Hill Air Force Museum. One of the missiles designed after these testing was the Nike missile designed to shoot down long-range Russian bombers. And in a twist of fate where history meets history, in 1956, one of them was tested on a B-17, successfully shooting it down. Funny story about the Starfighter. It was long and it was fast and it came out of the X-Plane series back in the day when they were breaking sound barriers. This was a fast, fast, fast plane. When I was a kid and 15 years old, we had a school work program and they sent me out to the Air Force Base just at the time as we were selling these to the Saudi Arabians. So when I was 15, I was sitting inside these things with a bunch of tools to unhook all the hoses to take the engines out. That was my funny story. And I got to talk to one of the pilots who said, this was in Denmark at the time, that these things have so unmaneuverable and so hard to fly in anything other than a straight line that basically by the time you made the turn, you had crossed the entire length of the country. But they were fast and they were cool. And speaking of tough, the Sky Raider behind me. I love the Sky Raider. This is a tough, 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 tough plane. It could take a lot of damage. It was sort of the warthog of its time. It was constructed at the end of World War II and it still flew in Vietnam. And as far as I know, there's still few of them flying in a couple of different countries around the world. Incredibly resilient. It could lift a lot of ordnance. It could lumber for a long time and support ground troops accurately. Unless he shot down some Nazi UFOs I'm not aware of, he didn't shoot any German planes down. One thing that's worth studying and noticing about Russian equipment while the tanks or planes, it is incredibly durable and tough. It will land on anything, it will run on anything, it will fly on anything. The Russians knew that they might have to fight a war living on dirt airstrips somewhere in the middle of nowhere. They built their planes, they built their tanks, they built everything, their weaponry, to be maintained very simply, crudely, rudimentally in the field, even almost up till today. Which is one of those things we should be maybe concerned about in our high-tech world, because when high-tech goes down, low-tech wins the day. A museum with a lot of planes and a lot of history, and remember, it's always run by volunteers, so if you can donate a little bit, do so. But it's free to go in, and you should, and you should bring your children here, because there's so much history from the replica of the Wright Brothers Flyer, the replica of the atomic bomb, to a lot of different planes from a lot of different eras. It's well worth a visit to come out here and take a look. Now behind me, there's a retirement ceremony going on. I'll be some Navy, some Air Force, some soldiers here. I'm not gonna intrude, gonna go away. But when you get here on your own to see this great museum, you get to see that section for yourself. So it'll be your secret. You have to come here to Utah and see it for yourself when there's nothing going on. And I really feel the uh, inefficiency of not having shaved for a few days. Now that I see all these clean shaven people in clean uniform, I feel so out of place. But hey, I'm on holiday. It's really hard to get a good shot of the Blackbird in here. But when we talk of sexy planes, the Blackbird must be counted. It is sleek, it is sexy, it is fast, it is an incredible airplane. It did the job. I wish they had retired it just for sentimental reasons. And I said it's not just for motorcycles, but black and red. It looks really cool together. Now we just need a bit of chrome on this thing and some wheels, and we'll call it a Harley. Yeah.
now, as you all know, I spend a lot of time going to historical places in search of history because history is fascinating. I'm out here in Utah. I'm looking at ground soil layers 112 million years old, and I'm looking at the authentic footprint of dinosaurs. Right here, dinosaurs, a lot of dinosaurs walked here. Their imprint of their feet was right here, and you can see them clearly. This is one of the most fascinating things I've seen. I mean, you go to modern modern battlefields, you see bunkers, you see their usual history. It's the most diverse dinosaur field in, in all of North America. This is, I, I'm lost for words. You really should see this, because here's creatures that lived way before any of us. And here's the remnants, here's the fingerprint of these enormous animals as they roamed this earth. That is really finding lost history. Maybe it was a battlefield because they did eat each other. This is something special, really, truly special. When I tell you I like Utah, there's some great people up here, there's some really good food, but the nature is absolutely stunning and one of the things we are forgetting in our modern everyday world of cell phones distraction fake news computers television all that stuff the texting the clickbait all that that distracts us from actual real life this is real life and it is gorgeous just a reminder if you kind of forgot who you are and can't find yourself in the middle of the big city Get away from it. Turn your phone off. Come sit in nature. Listen to it for a few days, a week. No electronics, just nature. It will do you good. Guys, I hope you enjoyed some of my shows, my movies I put up. Please subscribe to my channel, hit me a like, donate if you feel like it. And if you have any suggestions of things you'd like me to go, see, do, film, talk about, Drop me a note down below and I will follow up as soon as I can and do whatever I can to keep you guys entertained. Have a great day. <laughs>